topic of the day is uh, short-term rental, uh, also called vacation rental. Uh, what is short-term rental? We'll start with that in case anyone doesn't know. Uh, it's rental of uh, furnished homes for a short period of time. Short, somewhat flexible. Where, uh, we typically do two, you know, two to three nights is our minimum on our short-term rentals, but we've had rentals three, four, five months long. People rent for all kinds of reasons. Uh, they come in for um, their house shopping. So maybe they'll, they'll need a few months where they're looking for a home. They may have corporate assignments. They don't want to live in a hotel for three or four months. So uh, you get really the full spectrum of, of people and, uh, and stays. When you, when you think about kind of what it is and, and what your competition is, you know, just think hotels and bed and breakfast. That's, that's who you're benchmarked against. The feature somewhat varies. It's really more like a B&B &B because most of the hotels aren't going to give you kitchens and all those things. So you do have a leg up on on the hotels here locally, but they are your competition. How we got started is one of my favorite stories to tell. So, uh, 2012, 2012, we were living in our our duplex uh, in Zilker Park, and we we knew that uh, ACL and South by and all those things were in Formula One had been announced. So, we knew there was some money to be made, and we just couldn't quite get things where they needed to be, so we kept talking about it but not doing anything about it. Um, so we went to Colorado for my, for my birthday, met some friends out there, and we rented a house. And uh, we drove up, and on the way back, long drive from, from Colorado to Texas, um, my wife looked at me and said, I can do that. And I said, you can do what? She goes, I walked all through the house. I opened up all the cupboards and cabinets and looked around. She goes, I get it. I can do that. I get how they're doing it. So it just so happened that we were coming back home the first week, uh, first couple days of March. So we had like two weeks till South by. So I said, well, where are we going to go? Because that's our house. We're living in it. You know, it seems kind of unfair to collect all this money and then crash with our parents. You know, so um, what's the plan? And uh, we had always talked about one day when we were in our golden years, we would get an RV and travel the country. And I said, why don't we just get the RV now, um, and then we'll use that as a as kind of a getaway vehicle for whenever we want to rent the house. And so we got back. I went RV shopping. She got the house ready. Uh, we had it ready in four or five days and had it booked by the end of the week. And uh, did South by and it went really well. And then uh, we just left it up on the site just to see what would happen. And I'll get into some of the numbers and the results, but. Uh, Needless to say, we're still doing it here uh, over two years later, and we're now up to four units, and we're hoping to add at least one more, maybe two more this, this winter. So um, that's kind of our story. Advantages of short-term rental. I like to try and contrast short-term rental to long-term rental. Most people are very familiar with long-term, but it's always a question of, you know, sometimes it's a question of do I buy a short-term rental, but a lot of times it's a question of do I convert an existing long-term rental to short-term. Some of the advantages are uh, you can buy a house in a neighborhood that doesn't cash flow well. Mm -hmm. What you'll find in the long-term rental market is the higher the prices get to purchase the home, the rental rates tend to taper, so your cash flow is dropped. So the, the only houses that really cash flow well are those kind of sub-200s. And a lot of people, they don't, either from a standpoint of vanity or I don't want to go to that part of town, or whatever it is, don't want to own a house in that pocket, they don't want to deal with it. Um, this, the, the numbers that are generated through short-term rental allow you to buy in some really prime areas, and they, they help you make sense of some of the prices that are, that are being charged in, uh, in Austin right now. So, um, And it's a fun clientele. I mean, you have to kind of think of yourself almost like a B&B &B operator and say, you know, do I like, do I like meeting people coming to Austin from other places and my you know, social person, does that sound like fun to me? And, it, and in my experience, it is, it's a whole lot of fun. You meet some very interesting people. You can generate income from your primary residence. So if you, uh, and then the next one kind of ties into that, take a paid vacation. If you are always gone to family somewhere during the holidays, why not you know, rent your place out and pay for the plane tickets and everything else? Uh, same thing with South By. South by is in March, which is a great time to go skiing. So, um, and you, so you can go to Colorado and do your thing, and instead of having an empty house, you have a free vacation. Net income up to two times long-term rental. I'll show you a, a kind of a quick pro forma on our on our Zilker property at the end of the of the exercise. 
And uh, if you have a short term rental versus a long term rental, it's available for friends and family and activities. I was telling Lynn yesterday, we, um, there are times when we have friends who want us to come over and, and party on the weekends and they live on the north side of town and we're south, but we can move to the north house if it's empty and then it's a shorter cab ride and, and we can just kind of go crash there because it's always, it's always ready, you know, it's fully furnished. Pre-staged for sale, I think this is a real big advantage when you're talking about exiting because if you have a long-term rental, what typically happens is you put someone in it, they get in on a lease for a year, they generally, I'm not saying they, they destroy it, but it gets beat up and you don't get to see it. You know, it's like they move out a year later and surprise, it needs all the paint and all these things. Um, the issue is if you need money fast to sell that house or if you feel like the market is optimal for an exit, you are really constrained in a long-term rental because it's, you will never get top dollar for a house that has people living in it and, had, and is trashed. So it kind of, it gives you a lot more flexibility with a short term rental because not only can you list it in between stays or it's fully staged, it's ready to go, you don't have any leases to deal with um, and you can keep generating income right up until the day of close. You can have people in there right and then just move everything out, you know, a few days before. And then immediate gratification for upgrades. This is something we realized as we were going along um, on our houses. We put a lot of the money from the short term rental back into upgrading the property because what's great is if you know if you start looking at your house and you're like oh man you know the countertops are really uh, they don't look great in the pictures and i don't feel like we're quite up to competition in the neighborhood you can uh, go ahead and do that between your your bookings you get your contractors in do a small project take a new photo upload it that night and the next morning you'll have an inquiry so it's it's you can literally start generating and you start doing calculations the same calculations you do when you buy a property and start thinking of roi you can do that on a, on a much smaller scale when it comes to upgrades. You can say, well, if we can get one more booking or if we can get a $25 more a month for a kitchen upgrade and it only costs us five or 10 grand, then the ROI you know, typically is uh, pretty attractive. Disadvantages. Uh, requires more active participation than long-term rental. It's not set it and forget it. There's definitely things to be done. There are property managers out there that will do it for a pretty hefty fee, um, typically, I think as low as, I've seen as low as, maybe as low as 10, but really for a, to get what you want, which is somebody in there cleaning and booking and doing the whole bit, you're going to be in the 30 plus percent range. And that really, in most cases, that drags the return down close to a long term rental, but you still maintain some flexibility in, in usage. So there's still some benefits and, and obviously being able to buy it in other areas that you could in a long term. Sorry, it's got the yeah. 30%, th that includes the, the home away, for example. You know, home away, I consider that marketing, not project okay. management. That's going to be separate. Um, okay. the, um, there's economies of scale in everything, and this is no ex you know, exception. Um, we, <laughs> another story. So home away, we love home away. It's our preferred. We do 80% of our bookings through home away and 20% through Airbnb. We just like their system, we like their tracking, we like um, uh, just the flexibility of it. Uh, but So they have three tiers of pricing, and when we first started out, we got their bronze level annual membership for $400, and we got some bookings. And then as we started to do it more and more, um, we still weren't quite getting full occupancy, and actually there was, we, we had two units going at the time, and I was sitting up one night thinking about it, my wife had already gone to bed, and I. Full, full disclosure, my wife really, she runs all the marketing, all the prep, she coordinates all this, this is kind of her, her baby. Um, so I had this epiphany that, you know, we're doing, you know, fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000 a year in income, it seems kind of silly to be cheap on the, on the advertising, let's just go ahead and, and put it up to platinum, which is a thousand a year instead of four hundred. And it's effectively like buying a Google ranking. I mean, it just moves you right up to the front page. People are seeing you more. And I said, you know, whatever, it's a $600 experiment. My theory was if we get one weekend booking, we just paid for it. So let's just, so without consulting with my wife, I, uh, you know, about 10 o'clock at night, I upgraded both of the, uh, upgraded both of the properties to platinum, went to bed. And uh, we, you know, get up in the morning making breakfast, and she's like, "Oh my God, <laughs> I've got like seven emails," you know. So, um, 
Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's forever. So um, we actually ended up uh, within 14 days, we had $15,000 worth of bookings. I mean, it went just, our calendar just got slammed. Nice. So, um, so for, for people who are doing it, you know, full time, the property is dedicated full time to it. It's, it's definitely worth paying a little bit more to get that, to get that preference on their site. Other disadvantages, city regulations. I'll read, primarily, I'm going to refer you to website on this one because the, the rules do kind of change, but um, we'll talk a little bit about city regulations, but just know that there is a cap on the number of units that can be uh, short-term rental registered. You have to register with the city. It's $300 a year um, for the registration, and there have to be permits available. Once you have a permit, it's yours. So... You won't. You don't have to reapply, and then, but once you exit, if someone takes it and they hit cap, then um, you have to wait to to get reintroduced. So, and the the areas obviously that the by far the hardest area is is uh, 04, you know, Zilker, Barton, uh, uh, Bolton, but um, but they do still come up every once in a while, and you can just stay in touch with them, and he'll let you know, you know, when they when they come available. Hotel taxes. Sorry. Uh, sure. Uh, for that process, you need the property first to apply or, or, you, or you can you apply and then get You cannot there. apply for the permit until you own the property. Okay. That's my understanding. So it is, that is make it a little bit. Right. And supposedly they don't convey with a property. They do not convey with the property. So if you buy a property that already has a permit on it, it does not, it's in the name of the owner, not in the name of the property. So that, so the best thing you can do is you go to the website. I mean, for instance, they'll say there's 54 permits available for this. You know, there's, the cap is 54 and there's 40 taken. You're going to be fine making a 30 day close. But if it's 19 and 20, you know, and your whole model is built around this thing being a short term rental, you're taking a risk right. that, you know, so, and, and, and I'll talk a little bit about plan B in, uh, in this, but it's always good to have a plan B. Hotel taxes, they run 15% uh, is the hotel tax, that, and it's charged to the uh, occupant at the time of booking, but those have to be passed along to the city. Now, it only applies to stays under 30 days, so if you book for 30 days or more, there's no hotel tax, and we don't charge a hotel tax. So what, what it effectively does in our situation is it just makes our monthly rate a lot more competitive because people don't have to pay the hotel taxes um, and we and we've gotten a fair number of, of monthly bookings so because there's also all the time and effort required for cleanings and all that we actually took a we took a, uh, a long summer trip this summer and we booked all we actually had, had three this summer but we booked all three of them for 90 days plus we just pulled our rate down. That's the other nice thing is you can, you can adjust rates on the fly. We probably talk about our rates at least weekly. Um, we look at our calendar and we say, oh, well, this one's two weeks out. And there's no one staying in it and we don't need it. Seems kind of silly to have it sit empty. So, you know, if you lower your price, people will, people will book it. And you can look at where your competition is. So there's a little bit of that going on. And like I said, that's, my wife does that very well. She's always kind of trying to keep the occupancy levels up. Scott, for rentals that are longer than 29 days, mm -hmm. you know, do you do leases differently? Does that create no. a tenancy like under Texas law? Are there any sticky issues with the longer term rentals? I don't believe that it creates any issue in Texas. That's the nice thing about doing rentals in Texas. I wouldn't do it in California. I would not do it in California. I've heard nightmares, I've heard nightmares California. about California. Yeah, because they could create a tenancy situation. Yeah. We don't. Well, we haven't. We did a... Um, I did have... I did have a three-month booking that we went ahead and did a, a traditional lease on. And I think the idea there was um, just a larger deposit uh, that we wanted to collect. And actually, I don't even remember why. We could have done it without. A, I think we just wanted a little bit more protection on it, and so did they. So. But it's not an issue just doing it through the homeway system. Removal of personal items, this applies to homes that obviously that you live in, this is a real, and I'll get into some common questions that people have, which is, you know, where do you put your stuff? But um, I'll, I'll get into all that, but obviously, you know, people don't want to see your, your photos and your, you know, everything needs to be away and probably locked away, and we'll kind of get into that later. 
you don't need to have a license agent or broker. Or no, agent. no, not if you're the owner of the property. You don't. Matter of fact, you don't even have to be a licensed agent to be a property manager. Yeah, you do. Uh, yeah, you do. For other people, you probably yeah, for others, for own, not for your own properties. Your fine. Own, yeah, property selection. This is just some 101 stuff on on you know estimate nightly rate. We do that by looking at um, other. We go to HomeAway and we just see what the people in that neighborhood are renting for, and we look at their calendars and see how booked they are, um, and we get a feel for what you know not nightly rates look like. Uh, then we add in special events rates. Uh, it's about 20 to 25 nights a year. I can tell you that Formula One has really dropped off here as far as demand and, and pricing in the last, uh, since the first year. First year was gangbusters and, and we were getting probably three times our, our normal nightly. And now we're probably down to 1.5. We just get a slight premium. ACL is location dependent. The closer you are to Zilker, the bigger bump you're gonna get. We're the one in Zilker we get probably three times our rate. Um, but once further out, we might get one and a half to two. And then uh, South By, if you're in the core, South By is a moneymaker. It's 10 days and it's three times, you know, three times your rate. So, I mean, it's typically on a, on a duplex, we may be, I think we do like $20,000 in 10 days on a duplex. So, and so you, you calculate all that in, you've got to figure out what your occupancy is going to be. Just for, I mean, your occupancy is going to be driven by how actively, you know, how high are you ranked in your marketing? How act, how quickly are you responding to people to get bookings? How competitive is your rate? Um, those things really drive your occupancy. We, on the properties that we really try and keep occupied, we can exceed 200 nights a year. So, which is pretty much every single weekend and then some. Yeah, you know, the um, the one up north, I don't know. I don't know offhand what our nightly rate, nightly uh, occupancy or annual occupancy is is tracking at, um, and it's a little skewed because we that one's a cheaper house and the prices are cheaper and we seem to get a lot more uh, monthlies on the lower end stuff. Because people move to Austin, they, or they're, they're here for three or four months and they want a clean house. I mean, we rent that on a monthly for between, if it's just one month, like 2800 which is like $89 a night. So when you start thinking about a hotel and you've got, and you know, if you've got a dog, you get three bedrooms, two baths, a kitchen, and a yard. You know, it's better than any hotel. So, but in the higher end stuff, like our, on our Zilker three bedroom, the monthly rate might be five grand. And so that, and it starts to be like, uh, you know, it's, although it does still happen, so. So the location does have an impact. Uh, in the, uh... I, yeah, I think our nightly rate, we probably have just as much of an occupancy because of all those monthlies on the, on the perimeter properties, but we obviously, were, the revenues are lower, but as a percentage, it's still pretty good yeah. because it was a cheaper house to begin with. We'll get into operational expenses next. I'll break down kind of some of the expenses that are short-term specific, and then uh, take out your hot taxes. I kind of do a 10% average on my hot taxes. That kind of blends my under under 30 and over 30 throughout the year. So that's my just quick quick calculation. And then have a plan B uh, when we and this really pertains to property acquisition. When we buy a property for short-term rental, because you know one of the reasons I don't buy condos is for, for investment is because I don't like regulation. And this is a pretty heavily regulated uh, environment. There's no telling what Austin may do next year. So if you can't rent it long term or you can't see yourself flipping it or you really don't, if it just doesn't work any other way but short term rental, I would think twice because you can't control the city. Do you guys have any corporate bookings? <laughs> yes, yeah, we do have corporate bookings. We get quite a bit. Um, we love corporate bookings. We had quite a few in South By. We had like, um, I think some of the Verizon employees stayed with us. We had, um, we actually had HomeAway employees stay with us from HomeAway, and that was great. And then we, we didn't, uh, we were being considered, but didn't make the cut to uh, house Grumpy Cat during South By last year. So they came and previewed it next. They were planning on actually shooting a, a, a Grumpy Cat commercial. Or something. <laughs> 
So you get some, yeah, it's, it's entertaining. Expenses, you know, mortgage, you always have mortgage, whether it's short-term or long-term. Insurance, uh, our check with your insurance provider. We're very frank with exactly what we do on our properties with our insurance provider. And we tell them we short-term rent it. We make sure we get emails saying, yes, if something happens, you're covered, because it's a little different. Um, the, one of the things on insurance is if, if, you, if you're trying to add short-term rentals to your primary residence, your in, this is what I ran into with State Farm. Um, they, you have to have one property as your primary residence with a, with a standard policy, and then you can have a whole bunch of rentals. Um, so we actually did what's called a special events rider. And the special events rider just says, we intend to rent our primary residence for special events, and special events is pretty vague. So, matter of fact, I can't think of a weekend in Austin that doesn't have a special event. So that's, that's one way to do it on your, on your personal residence if you go that route. Obviously, we talked about hotel taxes. You have to take that out of your calculation. Uh, marketing expenses, we talked a little bit about that. I'll show you kind of what we actually spend here in a little bit. Housekeeping, pool cleaning, utilities. Keep in mind on utilities that you've got, you know, you're paying not just the electric and water and trash, but you need to give people television and you need to give them internet and make sure their internet works because nothing will get you a phone call faster than somebody showing up and internet's broken. What we do just for informational purposes, we give them one TV with a DVR in the living room and then we give them um, a Netflix in the bedrooms or actually in the master. So just kind of keeps things simple, you know. And sometimes we'll get the TV with the Netflix and does anybody have DVDs anymore? I don't know. You can get them with a DVD in there, but I think that's kind of on its way out. And then the Nest, love the Nest. Actually, I don't really love the Nest anymore. Um, I'm switching over to Honeywell because it's cheaper and because the Nest will only allow you to manage two properties on a given account. So what we do is we, we put, we put Wi-Fi thermostats on all of our units uh, because a lot of times people check out and we don't really want to run over there. We're not ready to go clean them. We're not ready to go prep them, but we really don't want the AC blowing at 68 degrees for three or four days. So if you do Wi-Fi thermostats, you can just check your phone and go, oh, boop, turn it down. Can you keep, they can't uh, play with the turf when they're there? They can and we let them, but you can actually set within the nest and probably Honeywell, you can set an upper and a lower limit. So you could say, all right, you know, 72 is cold enough. <laughs> <laughs> I need to crank it down to, I, you know, some people think if you crank it down to 65, it cools faster. It doesn't. So uh, consumables is another one. Uh, linens, towels, soaps, toilet paper, welcome gift. We typically do, typically just bottle waters, but sometimes um, we'll do beer or wine and then write a little welcome card and uh, just make sure it's fully stocked that they've got all the stuff they need. You have to think of it more like, you know, you're a hotel, you know. Okay. Have you had any issues with um, trash in your place? No, uh, we, and we've had a lot of rentals over a lot of time. We, by trashing, we've had people leave the place messy, you know, like stuff just scattered everywhere. Um, but we've had no real malicious damage. We've had things break, you know, but nothing that you couldn't see. You go, oh yeah, yeah, I can see that happening, so. Um, no, we've been really fortunate, and I think you know the the biggest thing we've had a, a couple of parties that got a little got a little loud, got a couple of neighbor calls, but a couple party calls in two years with you know three or four units is pretty good, and uh, we've had a um, we had one group that didn't leave, like they stayed one day longer than they were supposed to, and our cleaners showed up and they were still like passed out. <laughs> but then they left. <laughs> Insurance and legal. Here's the website, uh, austintexas.gov forward slash str. They've really improved this website. It's really good. You go to that page and you'll find the uh, census tract information. You can basically type in a property address. It'll tell you what census tract is it's in. And then you can click on a link and it'll tell you how many permits are available and, and what the total permits are. Uh, so you can tell very quickly if a house you're considering buying for short-term rental would, would have a permit available. 
certificate of occupancy, this is kind of a weird one. They want you to have a CO and there's actually a, um, if you already have a CO that's on file with the city somewhere from some previous time, they just process your application. If you don't, they actually require you to do a, an inspection uh, and it's not a full on, but it's pretty, it's pretty uh, involved and there's a, I believe there's a link on the website to what that inspection looks like. Um, and we had to do it on the last one. It was, you know, they're, make sure all the windows are working. It's a pretty long list of stuff. Uh, but, and our inspector charged us, um, he charged us like a hundred bucks to come out and do it. So it's a private inspection. The city doesn't send somebody out. No, no. But you have to have a licensed, how, yeah, licensed inspector fill out the form and sign it. And you submit that to the city then? With your application. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then they do and they do neighbor notifications as part of your fee, your three hundred dollar fee. And they do like I think it's a five hundred foot radius. They send a letter out to everybody in that radius and say, "This house is gonna has been approved for short term rental, and here's who you call if you have a problem." So if there's noise and they keep that piece of paper, they know how to reach you. Do the neighbors grumble at the idea of short term rentals? Uh, depends on the neighborhood. Um, depends on, on who you're renting to. You know, I mean, you, you, we do, we screen people via social media and so Lynn was asking me yesterday, do you ever, you know, do you ever turn down? And I, yeah, we probably turn down one out of every, you know, certainly one out of 10 gets turned down just because, and it could be we don't, we don't want to move out or we don't want to go make it ready or it could be that you go to their Facebook page and their profile pic is, gives you a strong indication that the house may not be in good shape when they leave. But uh, yeah, we kind, of, we kind of go through all that and make sure that we're comfortable with the people that are coming through. HOA and condo rules is a big one. Uh, the most, most HOAs and, well, most condos for sure have regulations preventing you from doing short-term rental. I don't know if the city checks that, but but if they send out a letter to your neighbors in the condo, you're going to get busted pretty quick. So that typically won't work. And then HOA, I don't know of any, a lot of HOAs that are putting that in place. But um, most of the core doesn't have an HOA. Yeah, but in most, in most of, at least in the condo HOAs, it's in there. Sure. By default. Yeah, and it then, is. And then when, when we do our HOA docs for our houses, we put it in there. Yeah, we had to too. Um, just because to get a lender to finance it, they want to know that you're not buying it for investment purposes. And so that's, yeah, condos are, are, are tricky. Rental special events. Yeah, we talked about a special events policy on insurance. Uh, you know, so just talk to your insurance agent. We also have a personal umbrella policy that we maintain, which is just kind of an overriding, if things go bad, talk to our insurance agent thing. So rental agreement, house rules, and manual. So. If you go to the Homeway site and you set, and they kind of walk you through all that. Uh, we, you know, you create a rental agreement. They, when someone books, they are accepting your rental agreement, which just can say, you know, no outside partying after 10 p.m. No, you know, you can set kind of the rules: no smoking in the house, um, and uh, and then you'll have a manual. We actually print out a little manual on the and put it on the counter, and it's just. It's a combination of who to call when things go wrong, but it's also a lot of um, how to how to run the house. You know, trash, especially for longer term people. You know, trash is picked up on Tuesday. Be great if you drug the cans out there so it didn't pile up. Uh, Wi-Fi passwords, and then we'll also throw in just some neighborhood information because you know you're hosting people, so you need to take it consider that and and uh, try and make their stay in Austin as pleasant as possible. And that's really one of the most rewarding parts of the whole process is, is helping people experience the town. So um, we include a lot of that in there as well. What about pets? So it's up to you. I, I can tell you that if you, um, that probably 80% of the, of the properties that are rented short term do not allow pets. Um, we, all of ours are pets considered we do consider pets. We have a dog we love, and uh, we almost always approve pets because it really gives us an advantage. And it, you know, if you've got things in the house, it's one thing. If you buy a house, 
to make it just short-term rental and you set it up so it's durable, then pets, allowing pets is only gonna help you. Um, if it's your personal home and you have like things in there you're really worried about, then maybe not. So, but you probably shouldn't have them in there at all. From the marketing standpoint, as I said, we use HomeAway and VRBO. They're one and the same now. They're two separate subscriptions. You can do like a VRBO add-on, but VRBO is owned by HomeAway now, and then Airbnb. Uh, you know, you do your you do your listing, set up your calendar, and maintain it. There's a whole algorithm. In addition to the whole platinum, bronze, silver thing, uh, there's an algorithm that determines where you rank uh, in a search, and it's driven by uh, referrals. So ask people, to, or sorry, reviews. Ask people to review you, encourage them to do so because more reviews, more recent reviews and more good reviews tend to move you up. And um, keeping your calendar updated moves you up. And then of course the biggest thing is, is your, the package you select on the front end. Um, stage your home. We've started doing professional photography on all of our all of our short-term rentals. I mean, my wife's great at this. She's, I mean, she rolls the towels up and folds the corners of the toilet paper. And I mean, when they shoot that thing, it just, you know, it looks amazing. So, because that's, you know, people are visual and that's how they're gonna make that decision. Scott, have you tried FlipKey? Just... I know people have used FlipKey. So we don't use property managers and we don't manage other people's properties on short-term rental. And part of the reason is because we hold our properties to a certain standard and we don't think anyone else could could touch it. And that's also why we don't manage other people's properties because we don't have any control. We can't control the furniture, we can't control any, really much of anything, the maintenance, and we just don't want to attach our names to something that we don't have complete control over. So, um, But yeah, we've got neighbors who use FlipKey and they say it and they really like it. And they say it's a great hands-off system and they do it all so I've heard good things just not for us calendars photos uh, reviews and then as I mentioned before it's really important to HomeAway has an app Airbnb has an app we've got little alerts so should sound like a cash register though you know <laughs> get you moving faster but we do we get back to people within hours and it makes a big difference because people will almost always send out multiple inquiries to see what you know what's out there and we're having I mean we're trying to book for New York right now on you know in Manhattan and I mean it's crazy I mean we go we'll send out 10 requests and get one or two people come back within two or three days and then the rest not at all. So unless you uh, talk about you know, how you would uh, the appliances maybe offer Craigslist and so mm -hmm. and you know your longer term rentals when you're furnishing mm -hmm. these properties, um, what do you guys do? Because you're, you mentioned more like higher and finishes, and I'm assuming that this mm -hmm. applies with the furnishings. Yeah, I think, you know, and this is, you know, furnish your home based upon the target renters in the neighborhood. You've got to just think about, you know, what price level you're trying to achieve and you want to give them. When people are buying houses, what they want is they want it to be nice. When people are renting a house, they want it to be clean, number one, clean, clean, clean everywhere. And funky is totally acceptable. So I would, you can, you can remodel on the cheap. You can put quirky little garage sale nightstands and, and just make it kind of fun. And, and people will totally respond to that because it's not where they live. It's just where they're staying. And it looks, you know, very interesting. But by far the most important thing is it's got to be so clean. I mean, there's, I, I, it gets you so many, and when it comes to reviews, you, that will be the fastest negative review you will get. If someone gets into the shower and it was not spotless, um, they will post that and it will, it will hurt you. So um, we, and that's, when it comes to cleaning, we have, um, we have one cleaning person, we pay them very well, and, but they, and you need to find some, and you probably will have to pay your cleaning person pretty well. Uh, one, because you need it to be right, and you need them to not just clean, but also organize, which is everything in the, in the right place. And then um, you need them to be available to you on pretty short notice. I mean, a day or two, you need them to be able to be over there and get it done. 
So what my wife's done is she actually created a, a, prep, a prep list kind of as a training tool. And now that that's all done, now that we have someone in place, we don't really need it anymore. But um, if they ever quit, then we certainly would. But it's every single thing that needs to be checked on the house before people show up. So this is the case all over with all of your three and a half properties you met in the neighborhood. It kind of the same rule applies as others. Mm-hmm. Yep, and we do when we buy a new one. It's 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 fun. I mean, we go to Target and and uh, we do a lot of Craigslist and and look for people kind of moving and selling a bunch of stuff. And we pick up artwork and couches and chairs. Um, we do um, you know all the linens and towels and stuff. Obviously, we buy those new and we and we buy nothing but white, 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 everything white. And then you can just throw it into the laundry with a whole bunch of bleach and it's clean. And so. I would strongly recommend that you stick to white. And then in your personal house, I mean, we, as I said, everything comes out. So all of our sheets, all of our linens and everything go into a closet that's locked. All of our personal effects get all tucked away. All the clothes come out of the closet. You'll find this is a great exercise to become a more minimalist person. So, Do you have a budget that you typically try to stick to for furnishing a home, like per square foot or per per house, or does it just vary? We just look for deals and things we like. I would say that probably we spend three to five thousand dollars to furnish a house, a twelve hundred square foot three bedroom. So, bedding the actual. Beds, one of the largest costs. I'm assuming you have to buy those new. Yeah, we we do. We it depends. We bought new beds. We bought not new beds, but we always um, we do we put the the a pretty nice like waterproof padded covers over all the mattresses, so that those are completely washable too. And then we throw the sheets on that just to make sure that the all the mattresses stay clean. What do you pay for your cleanings? Mm, probably, average is about 80 bucks. Um, you know, it just, uh, you know, and the houses are, there's, there's uh, it's, it ends up being about 20 bucks an hour. So they're, they're in there, one person's in there for about four hours to get it knocked out and they're doing all the linens and laundry. Not a ton of cleaning, it's really just more kind of organizing because um, the houses stay pretty clean uh, all the time, so they never get very far. And do you, so if you've, you've got a booking, mm -hmm. let's say, okay, so somebody's moving out on Sunday afternoon, they're going home, and you've got your next one on Friday, do you get your cleaning people to come in on Thursday as opposed to on Monday? No, we, we'll, we'll usually clean on Monday or Tuesday. Um, our typical cycle is, uh, yeah, people will check in on Thursday or Friday, check out on Sunday or Monday, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, you know, and we'll go ahead and just start doing our cleanings probably Tuesday, Wednesday. And we usually go ahead and get them done in the event that, that we want to stay there, family wants to stay there, or we do, we've had last minute bookings like, you know, people in the morning will say, I want to check in this afternoon and we'll do a check on them and say, they look pretty good. And it's nice because you just be like, oh, here's, the, yeah, that's the next thing. We'll say, here's the key code. So that's, all of our houses have the little $35 um, combo box to the right of the door, key's always in it, um, opens everything except for, for, if we have a garage, the garage is locked separately and that's usually where everything goes. Um, if we don't have a garage, then we usually have a closet that has a separate lock on it that, where everything goes and we put personal items, but also soaps and towels and all, all the kind of the cleaning supplies, et cetera, that they don't need access to. Um, so we don't actually meet them at properties. We communicate with them a couple, two to three days before We'll send them directions um, on how to get there, what's around, and, and most importantly, combo code and Wi-Fi password. Make sure they've got what they need to get started. And then they can show up whenever they want. Have you changed your combo code or you just keep it the same? Or? We change it. We usually change, we change our combo code pretty much every single time. And we, we've started doing our, our locks with, um, the rekeyable locks, and we probably rekey every month or two on all of our properties. Just kind of we and we we just rotate. You know, we have like sets of keys. Like we'll have ten. Like just pick a random key, make ten copies of it, and then do that like five or six times, and just have them somewhere. And then um, every 
every couple months you just switch from this key to the next key to the next key just in case somebody walks off with a key and decides they're going to come back because you know, keys disappear you're never going to keep track of all your keys. Have you thought about just putting the keypad locks on? I have. Um, the problem I had with the, key, the one keypad lock that I tried installing is if that door gets, if the door gets misaligned, they don't have really strong motors. So if the door gets misaligned or the um, battery dies, I get a phone call and I don't want a phone call. So, yeah, we thought about it. It'd be awesome if it worked. Yeah. It's just. I have one on my house and I love it. Yeah, well yours, no, yours stayed aligned and it's, yeah. No, it doesn't. You just have to, you know. You get to jiggle it, yeah. <laughs> Stock the kitchen. Uh, this is, you know, you're going to need to, you know, you're going to need uh, blenders are optional, but just think about all the stuff, you know, blow dryers and the bathrooms and in the kitchen you're going to need, uh, you know, full sets of utensils and some, and some pots and pans and um, most of our houses have a, a propane grill out in the yard somewhere. Um, but beyond that we really don't do, might be a granola bar in there, that's about it. And this is the operations manual piece. Um, we put instructions for using the appliances, electronics, and equipment. It's your, you know, I know you know how to work your TV, and it makes sense to you, but not to them. So this avoids a lot of phone calls if you can get all this set up. Emergency contact sheet in case anything goes wrong. We were talking earlier about things that go wrong. We haven't had too many. We, we did have, um, we had an AC go out in the middle of the summer with a really, you know, good booking, and so we. Um, we got our AC guy over there same day, but it still took five or six hours, and we actually bought them up. We gave them, we ran over there and dropped them a hundred dollar gift certificate to Chewy's. Told them to go have margaritas, and we'd call them when it was ready. So, um, so we try and take really good care of them. They're paying a fair bit of money to stay there, so if anything goes wrong, it's really good to over over correct. Um, the um, other thing we had this spring, which is really entertaining, was the. Um, uh, the wind blew our neighbor's huge oak tree down and it ripped out two power poles, including the, um, it tore the power line out of our main panel and it was laying on the ground. So I got the call, yeah, power's out, well, let me call the city. And they were like, yeah, your power's not out. And I was like, I was like, well, go check the main breaker. And he comes back and he goes, oh, the power lines are laying in the yard. And I go, don't check the main breaker. <laughs> Stay in the house. So that one we actually, fortunately we had another vacancy on one of our other units. We moved them over to the other unit because that was, a, that was two or three days to get that. Because then after they put the poles in, I went back and they're like, the city's like, it's all done. Poles are in, it's all done. Great, that's great, look at that. Look how good they are. You get over there, electric meter's gone. Oh, oh yeah. You know this one. Yeah. Lynn's, Lynn's already knows the ending of the story because yeah. she well, deals with the city all the time. There's a lot of so I said, well, why did that happen? They said, well, the, um, because you're, um, we didn't have a weather head. We had one of the old, like, pulley. Mm -hmm. So you're not to code anymore. And I said, why well, wasn't the code yesterday before the tree hit it? You know, I don't, you know. So they're like, no, no, you got to get an electrician out, put in a weather head, probably need to replace the panel while you're at it. You know, so that was. $1,000 later. <laughs> Pretty close. Yep. <laughs> okay, and then just check in, check out procedures. Uh, my wife, well, one of the, my wife's least favorite words is, is QT, which stands for quick turnaround, which is defined as a check in and check out on the same day. So, and you do have those quite a bit. We have, you know, people leave it, they're leaving on Sunday morning and someone wants to check in on Sunday afternoon. So we uh, typically have an 11 a.m. check out and a 3 p.m. check in. It gives us four hours to get in there and, and get it prepped, which is usually enough. Be a little hairy there. Do you you don't do check in check out in person though? Do you? No, um, no. It's just you just have a procedure surround. We just send the cleaning okay. person over, and usually Sally runs by there right before check in of the new party, and just says, "Yeah, looks good." You know, key box in the door and out. So. Tracking and payments. So um, we talked a little bit about nights booked and revenue goals. Uh, I'll I'll. Here in just a second, I'll break down our, our spreadsheet for you. The, um, we set the nightly, weekly, and monthly based upon the competition, tax preference, that's hotel taxes, um, personal, personal usage and management interest. So that just comes down to 
you know, obviously longer term bookings are a lot less work. They're maybe a little less money, but they could be, a, you know, if you can get a three or four month booking, you know, and, and you, even though your nightly rate's lower too, it's booked the whole time. So, you know, we've had, we're always looking at that to say, yeah, we, we do a deal here because we're probably not going to do much better trying to do it every single weekend. Usually if we can get a monthly booking, that's, that's, we set it to uh, three weekends. So if, if we can get a full monthly for three weekends and we have no desire to use that house for ourselves, then we'll go ahead and, and book it at that rate. I have a question on your long term. Mm -hmm. um, how do you handle the linens and towels and those types of things on the long term rental as opposed to short term? So like a six, that's a good question. So um, we don't. We, they have their sheets. All of our houses have laundry facilities. You know, they all have washer dryer. Um, some, you know, my wife will sometimes offer them like cleaning service at, you know, for our cost. So we'll tell them if, if you, we always take care of lawn work. That's always part of it. Um, we ask them to take the trash in and out and we tell them if, if they would like a cleaning, um, at any time, we're happy to schedule it. It's $80 or something. We'll just add it to their, to their bill. Tracking and, and of payments and expenses, um, on the payment side, that's one of the, we, we love the homeway system. At the end of the year, we have a full log of who checked in, you know, who checked out on what dates, how much that was transferred. It's, it's super easy. It's all connected to our bank account. So, and they have book it now options where it's just click, click, you know, we do have to accept it, but they'll book it. It's locked. It's on the calendar. You click accept and the money comes right into your account. So it's a really cool system. And then on expenses, uh, the biggest expense tracking other, that's not similar to long-term rental would be consumables and cleaning. And that's just a matter of, you know, just keeping your receipts and having an organization system for it. Do you ever mess with the uh, BRBO's um, guarantees or deposit, security deposits or anything like that? We have on, we've only ever collected one security deposit in all of our rental, and it was like $300. And... Uh, it was two things. The place was trash, but they also did not move out by checkout. So they were staying into another day and that was about the nightly rate. So um, they have the insurance. So we've been kind of round and round on this. With You can do one of two things when it comes to deposits. You can charge them a deposit, hold it, and return it, which is what we started doing. Because the, our theory was, if you're holding their money, they're just gonna behave better. And I still think that's probably true. Whereas if you let them buy a $49 insurance protection plan, what do they care? They've already paid for it. You know, there's really nothing to hold them accountable. Um, we really have, we, we charge deposits kind of as we feel like they're maybe necessary. Um, last minute bookings, sometimes we'll charge deposits just because our, our, our experience has been that people, that a lot of people that book at the last minute are just kind of wishy-washy and and we, that those have been some of our worst our worst experiences but we you know but it's still it's not like every one we would never do it again um, it's just been as a percentage it's a little higher so we will we'll hold something from them but holding checks and returning checks is a big pain in the butt it really is um, even if you do it through the PayPal system it's like Fees get charged in both directions, like a one and a half percent credit card processing fee, and then people, oh, I didn't get all my deposit back, and you know, so then you're eating a portion of deposit. So, so at this point, we um, what have we been doing? We've actually been charging our own damage waiver. We just did that. We just said, you, you know, say what? fifty bucks damage waiver, mm -hmm. and then you just keep all the fifty dollars. Mm -hmm. And then we just, if something breaks, we just fix it. We're like, why would we give fifty dollars to HomeAway every time if nothing's breaking? Why don't we just collect that and then we'll be ready, and then we don't have to fight with them over over the whole process. And do people self -insure. usually pay for it? What's that? What's generally? What do they do? Oh, they do. I think what we do is we just make it a charge. Mm -hmm. It just automatically gets added in. It's you're going to pay us forty nine dollars, and then you know if something breaks, we'll just fix it. And so that's included in the booking you're saying mm -hmm. on these systems. Yes, you can charge that. You can you can add any any litany of surcharges. You can do you can do a pet charge. You can do a insurance charge. I mean, whatever you can create your own line item and call it whatever you want. All right. So here's the 
financial piece of it. This is a two, that full year 2013. This is the Zilker duplex. Um, so up here you have you know, unit A, unit B, income, <coughs> expenses, and net income. So, and then this combined column is, uh, we have a third listing on this property called the Big Zilker. And effectively what we're doing is we're, we're allowing you to book both sides of the duplex simultaneously. And we, we did that because we found out that um, some people are looking for a place that, that they can put like 12 people in. And so we weren't coming up, but we might've had both sides available in the same building. So it's a great fit. So it, it, it's nice to have that and it's been pretty good. So in 2013, our total revenue on this one duplex was 112,852. We had $57,000 in expenses. We'll break those down here in a minute. And our net income was $53,398. Uh, I did a long-term estimate. This is based upon just my personal knowledge of what three-bedroom and two-bedroom properties rent for in that area. And had we rented it long-term, we would have had 22.8 on the small side, 28.5 on the big side, a total of 51.3. Um, I removed the expenses that were attributable to short-term rental only, and we have you know, a much lower expense, $22,000 versus $57,000 in the, in the short term. And when it all shakes out, you're doing $55,000 here versus $26,000 on a long terminal. But keep in mind that if we weren't running this ourselves and we were paying someone 20% of $112,000, these numbers would be pretty close.